You're listening to the Nerd to Know Media Network. Hello and welcome to the Game Corner. Before we get to our special guest, we just have a few little disclaimers to get out of the way. The Game Corner has its own Facebook page and Instagram, so you can find them online. And if you want to appear on the show, you can contact them directly as well as following the original social media page. I'd also like to thank the lovely people at Tabletop Cork for appearing on our show this week. They have some lovely recommendations for both advanced board game players and for families. You can now find that on the Facebook page. A quick little disclaimer for families who may be listening to this episode. There is a little bit of swearing in the first half. So if that's something that's an issue, then uh, this episode might be the one to skip. But if you stick around, we do have two fantastic guests on. We have Keith Byrne, who not only did the artwork for this show, but is also the character designer on Danger Mouse. So he's certainly a bit of a celebrity on this channel. He's got a lot of interesting things to say about the gaming industry. We also have Martin Karen, a friend of the show, who's an engineer who's got a lot of games that could be played on Zoom that he'd like to talk about. So very interesting. He would have loads of kind of family-friendly things that are definitely worth checking out. So without further ado, here they come. And thank you very much for tuning in. All right, so you're listening to the podcast. You're like, hey, I'm not in Ireland. How do I get in touch? Well, TuneIn has you covered. That's how you can check us out live when we're on the radio. Um, You go to TuneIn and download the app, or you can check out the live streams on nairthnomedia.com or phoenix92.5 FM. If you want to get in contact with us, it's very easy. Media everywhere. Media on Twitter. Media Instagram. Media on Twitch. Media at gmail.com if you want to reach out via email. Hope to hear from you soon. Hello and welcome to the Game Corner, where we talk about all the games that everyone has been playing since the lockdown has begun. And today we have a very special guest today. We have Keith Byrne, uh, a character designer, who I believe you actually have a bit of news today, Keith. Didn't someone very special like one of your animations, one of your drawings? Oh yeah, my very uh, my very hashtag humble brag is uh, the current voice of uh, Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck. So I'm, I, uh, I've been recently uh, inspired to redesign the Wall of Looney Tunes. Saw them on Twitter and, and liked them. So that was a that was a pretty good that was a pretty good day. <laughs> yeah, that's a huge boost. And before we get into all the games and stuff, you kind of from what it, what it looks like on your Instagram, which is I believe K Jables, is it? In case anyone wants to find you. Mm. Uh, you yep, put up K like, Jables, yeah. Yep. You kind of put up new artwork almost every single day. I feel like every time I open any of my social media things, there's a Godzilla or uh, something else that you've done, like just like almost on a daily basis. Like, uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's kind of all I all I really do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, I think I saw someone post it today where it's just like, uh, oh, what's your main cause of stress? Oh, drawing. What do you do for a living? Drawing. Uh, does it cause you a lot of stress? <laughs> yes. Like, how do you relax? It's like, oh, I draw. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I don't know where I, I saw that somewhere on the internet today, but that kind of sums it up, really. Um, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's my greatest uh, cause of stress and relaxation in my life. So, Yes, uh, I was chatting to... Uh, Katie Riley on another show she's going to be doing about artists, which is coming out this week. Uh, and that seems to be the main trend with all the artists she's been talking to, which is that it's the greatest source of stress and also the greatest source of relaxation. Like, And actually, it's worth pointing out before we get into the games, if you're listening to this show on Spotify or on SoundCloud or whatever, that illustration of me, you did it, Keith, didn't you? Yes, I did. I was very happy to do it. It gave, it gave me something to also think about. And so. I, I can't. I, I know I'm gonna like make you blush, but I can't gush about a how good it turned out and b how quickly you did it because I think I asked you at like ten o'clock at night, and within twenty minutes you had like four options. Like you work super fast. That was uh, that's that's the thing my uh, my college tutors hated, and my managers really like is how fast I can be <laughs> so, um, <laughs> there's two uh yeah so it was kind of it's it got me if it, it failed me in college and then it gets me way more work in uh in real life so you know college and schools doesn't really matter 
I uh, will sure the, as far especially with artist gigs like the world's run by the people who turn up like did you ever hear like Neil Gaiman's three rules about being a creative person which is like uh you need to work hard do good work and always have your work in on time and you can get away with usually two out of three yeah pretty much <laughs> um well, yeah, no, it was a it was a very fun process to do, and I uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm trying to like it was lately. I've been trying to like get better at caricatures and stuff like that. So it was it was kind of right in my wheelhouse to do. So, well, thank you very much for it. And uh, before one more question before we get into the games, how do you pick what you do for your like daily drawings? Like, um, it's kind of like maybe I'll be reading uh like reading a comic or uh watching a film and i'll just want to draw something from what i was reading or watching um and then when it comes to like kind of the nightmarish stuff that i draw that's kind of just what goes on inside me so <laughs> that's where that comes from yeah i didn't want to bring this up but one image jumped out at me it looks like kind of a a slight a loaf of bread with eyes or something like that Oh, Jimmy the Brick. Um, That's yeah, it, Jimmy I the should, Brick. Uh, I'm really into like body horror and stuff like that. Like David Cronenberg, one of my favorite directors, um, and Clive Barker is like one of my favorite writers, and they're both kind of into that kind of. Uh, I'm very much into like transformation and what the human body can be pushed into and stuff like that. Um, on a sexual level, yeah, also that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's that's like that's just like a, a facet of me. I I just really like drawing like weird stuff. I I'm pretty sure I have a I recently I have a, like a a horse that has fingers for mouth for a mouth on there as well. Um, because my friend said that a horse's lip has the same kind of muscle setup as fingers, so I thought it'd be cool to draw a horse, but it has fingers for lips. Um, yeah, so I must say, there. looking through your gallery, oddly enough, the least disturbing of them is the Ridley Scott alien, which is hard to do. It's hard to make him the cutest in your gallery. Like, oh, I'm I'm a big fan of making like horrific things pudgy and cute. That's a that's a thing I like to do. <laughs> so you like to make horrific things cute and then cute things terrifying. Yeah, to be honest, it's uh, I don't know. Like I said, it's it's there's probably some sort of pseudo psychological sexual thing into it but uh yeah well that kind of leads nicely into the games you want to talk about so you're a gamer what have you ah, been exactly. i know you're appreci i appreciate you're still working but what have you been playing since all of this began uh my main thing is i'm playing games about horrific uh plagues viruses uh and pandemics because it makes me feel like well it could be a lot worse <laughs> um what we're going through here now so i'm currently on my i want to say sixth or seventh replay of resi 4 um i'm also playing uh zombie army which is a very good game by rebellion it's basically third person um left for dead it's i don't know if it's fiber anymore it was a fiber on psn if people want it but i highly recommend it it uses the um the elite sniper engine uh, it's their, it's, uh, it's like their kind of, it's like their COD zombies, um, for their series. Uh, and I was playing a lot of Dying Light because that was on sale as well. I just kind of picked it up because I'd always wanted to try it. And that's, uh, I don't know if you've heard the game series Dead Island. I actually haven't, no. Oh, okay. Well, Dead Island was like, it had like this amazing, like beautiful trailer. Uh, and it was supposed to be set in uh, like a resort island just as a zombie kind of virus hits. And like you were kind of scavenging your way to, uh, first person style to like get out of it. And the trailer is gorgeous. And it's like, um, I, I do, well, actually the trailers for both games are like ridiculously good. And I really wish they put as much effort into the trailers, uh, into the games as they did for the trailers. Um, well, I think that's it, kind of the norm in the game industry, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately so, because <laughs> both times when the games came out, they were, like, critically, like, destroyed because they just weren't nearly as good as, like, the beautiful, uh, like, evocative uh, trailers portrayed them as. The, uh, like, the first trailer, like, has this beautiful score, and it's, like, uh, it's, like, uh, it's a family kind of boarding up their hotel room from the zombies while their daughter is, like, changing into a zombie in the back. 
uh, in the background, but it's shot in reverse. So it's like them, they've fallen out of the window and they're slowly like coming back up into the hotel room, the glass is fixing and stuff like that. Um, and like the, I remember like in the trailer drop, like everybody thought like, this is it, this is like the, like, you know, fucking get out of here, left for dead. This is the new, the new thing. Uh, and it just wasn't like, I think it came out. And no one... <laughs> well, <laughs> like since this... we talked about the Ridley Scott aliens, I've got to ask, did you ever play aliens, colonial Marines? I did because, like many people, uh, Randy Pitchford, fucking snake oil salesman, as he did, got me. <laughs> I did. I got very excited for it, and I, like everybody else, I was very uh, disappointed. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think the my favorite thing to come out of it is like, have you seen that clip of like the alien trying to move, but it's got stuck on the table? So they've stuck on that "Hello, my baby, hello, my honey" yeah. song. Can someone say, "Do you know uh, Larry Bundy on YouTube?" Do yeah, you know yeah, yeah. His work. Yeah. Uh, with fact, I think he was saying it, or somebody else. They were saying like there's like one someone spelt uh, the word "through" incorrectly <laughs> or something <laughs> in the quote. And at one because they spelt it, I think they spelled T H R U D. They spelled T H U O. They they split the the vowels in it anyway, and that one little clip is why the aliens are like that. Oh no, really? It's just something like, that simple. If that small. If you just like switch, if you just like spell like one letter is is wrong in the code, and otherwise the aliens would work properly. Mm. Um, and the game probably would have been like a lot better. <laughs> like it would, it still wouldn't have been. Like her, it's it still wouldn't have been like the the next best thing in gaming, but it's it would have it probably wouldn't have been like the absolute disaster that it was, or was it? I know it's I think someone spelled pecan wrong in the code. Pecan's like a a coding term, I think. Right. Someone spelled pecan wrong, and that's why the aliens don't work right. Even uh, and if they worked right, the game probably would have been a bit better. And because uh, originally the aliens are supposed to stalk you properly, they know where you are on the map, and they're supposed to like use like complex algorithms to like properly stalk you and trap you and everything. Well, like, like alien that. isolation, where they learned your patterns and that kind of stuff. Like exactly, yeah. Um, so it was it was supposed to be that, um, but someone spelled pecan wrong, and uh, that's why the game is the game for them. So, well, then um, you seem to be quite an insider on all this kind of stuff. Can I ask, do you think there is a trend in why the trailers are, like, you know, on a really high bar and then some of these games don't turn out that way? Do you think, is it, like, crunch yeah. period? Is it just misleading? Like, what do you think are the symptoms um, of that, like? Speaking as someone who works within, like, a, a, a medium-like games, uh, the trailers, you never do the trailers yourselves like the game companies don't do the trailers yeah uh, do you know what i mean like a, yeah. a separate anime hired to make the trailer uh a lot of times obviously not with the visuals of the game mm. um and everything like that like it's it's always like this like gorgeous amazing thing uh like tra cinematic trailer with like the kind of graphics that we won't see as playable in a game probably till like two generations down the line and everything like that, and it's it's been and it's hyped up, and they've got they've spent like half the half they've spent like probably ten people's salaries on like a song that everybody knows, and they've tweaked <laughs> it so so that it's cinematic as all hell, um, uh, to really get you hyped, and of course, like like we're saying, Snake Oil Sales and Randy Pitchford, you know. They'll come out and they'll be like, look at this. This is how the game is going to look. We promise. Wink. Do you know what I mean? And well, then, I like, suppose, that's... yeah, because isn't a big part of the game industry those big expos where, you know, they have the designers yeah. on stage with the trailers and everyone's in the room and Keanu Reeves and, uh, comes out and all that malarkey. Yeah. And the next thing you do is like you get like, you'll get your Fallout 76s or stuff like that where it's like, uh, like a lot of times like, you you're as someone who works in there you're never actually told what's going on in the outside world a lot of the time <laughs> like <laughs> and, um, you, you see like your boss who you've probably met like once or twice and they're up on the stage and they're just like oh it's going to be four times as good as the last one it's going to be three times the definition 
and you're sitting there going like he doesn't know what the fuck he's saying we can't do <laughs> what is he saying like, um, like a lot of the times a lot of the times that's what's going on it's like someone someone who uh either has never worked in that industry or hasn't worked in that industry in a long time um because i know like there's people like randy Pitchford who used to be like a really good level designer he did level designs for like a lot of the old like build engine games like uh Duke Nukem, Shadow Warrior and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like he used to, he used to care and stuff like that. Uh, or oh, who's the Fallout guy? Because I'm not, I'm not a big Fallout fan. No, I'm afraid uh, I haven't played it. I, I know it by reputation, like, but. Oh, that's going to bug me. But that guy, you know, <laughs> he, he promised the moon and the stars for 76. And he's like, oh, it's going to be four times the map size, 15 times the resolution and everything like that. And like he used to be, like a really talented uh, game designer as well. He made, he worked for, he went to work in Bethesda for the, in the 90s and he made like two really good um, old uh, Terminator FPSs. Mm. And like he was doing stuff in the 90s that like only, you only get now. Like he was essentially making like uh, the Far Cry games, the modern Far Cry games in the 90s, if you get what I mean. Yeah, I get you. Uh, big epic grand scale first person shooters in the 90s that were like physically impossible and you're just thinking like you guys did all this you know how it's done but you've just been out, probably out of the game so long uh with, and like probably had your head so far up your own asses that you don't actually realize how games are made anymore do you know what i mean yeah um, well actually since you were talking about that i just i've got in my head like an imaginary game designer and one of these executives goes up on the stage and promises it'll be like 3d and four times the speed and five times the ramp and all this kind of stuff and they're just like crying because now they have to deliver on it even though they never like were told to do it like that kind of miscommunication yeah. like oh man i've worked on uh i've been brought on to a show as a character designer and i'm thinking like oh this will be this will be fun this is like a this is like a preschool <laughs> this is going to be a preschool show there's not going to be too much to do it in it and then what i haven't realized is the person who sold this show that to to sold us to get it, this show has promised the greatest tv show that's ever like <laughs> come before it's like yeah it's a preschool show but it's going to be something that it, the worst thing ever to hear is uh it's a pre it's it's this show but it's going to be for everybody because then you know it's oh, like great no and it's not even their fault like i mean it's it's important obviously to hype up a new thing so people check it out but like that's yeah. fundamental miscommunication just throws oh, yeah. everything off the rails like uh, a lot of times, a lot of issues like this are will always come down to a marketing problem. Right. Marketing will push this to because that's their job. They they are there to make what you're doing seem like something you want to buy. That is their job, and they have to do their job. But they could like lie less. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I I also worked on a I worked on a show where we were selling toys of the of the show mm. i'm not gonna say it because i don't want to get blacklisted no that's fair uh, that's fair like complaining about stuff i've worked on um so i'm gonna say this show that i worked on where we were make where there was a toy uh toy line in conjunction with it and like we were like trying to you're trying to make like uh deadlines and crunch and everything like that and you're just like yeah this character looks good cool 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 and you, you'll push it through because you think that actually looks really good and it's going to animate well and everything like that and then the toy people are like ah uh, it doesn't you know we think it could look like more dynamic and cool like the toy right mm. and you're like all right but it's not going to animate well and you're just like ah oh, you guys you know you guys will figure it out <laughs> all right cool so you go back and you spend another week trying to get this thing looking like uh like the toy like sometimes the toy people will send you concept art as well mm. which they should never do because toys and yeah anyway like name me one cartoon where the where the fucking toys look like the show yeah unless it's like <laughs> a pokemon situation where the characters or like Oh, where like the, they the cartoon followed They're the toys in the first place yeah. that kind of thing they're inherently based on a toy, but we were coming, we were coming onto something that there was a toy line already, and there was a show based on that toy line. But this was the sequel show, so there wasn't the toys ready yet. So we were constantly in like a fight with the toy people, um, and and then eventually the toys came out, and I remember feeling like unbelievably disappointed because they looked nothing like the show, 
nothing like the concept art they'd sent us and they were like really poorly painted as well oh no and being like really angry because i was just like the amount of arguments i had to have uh, the amount of times where I, just, I was just told to like just do what the toy people want and like i was like oh this is what i get for this is like <laughs> like this <laughs> You've um, got to send me a photo of these things off the air. I'm yeah. dying to see. I I hate going... to I hate to break up your flow, but we actually oh, yeah. only have seven minutes left because oh that's goodness, what happens that's when you start talking about, I suppose, Randy Pitchford. But um, yeah. I want to ask you mentioned something really interesting just before we started recording, which is that yes. in these troubled times, you find zombie games really relaxing, like your Resident Evils and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Why is that? Um. It's it's a it's to do with my anxiety and uh, and stuff like that. Like I I suffer uh, like a, like a lot of people with a lot of anxiety. Uh, I take Lexapro and my Xanax and stuff like that to, to keep me functional. Mm. Um and like with situations like this, it's kind of like you're. Uh, for instance, with the with the current pandemic going on, I already was very clean with washing my hands and everything like that. And this was kind of like. It was like the best worst case scenario where I was like, I was like, I'm right. I knew I was right this whole time. <laughs> I didn't want to be right this whole time. Um, yeah, so, it's a bittersweet yeah. vindication. Like, yeah. yeah. I had this eerie calm about me where I was just like, well, I kind of suspected this was coming because my brain hates me. <laughs> it's uh, like, uh, do you ever see Father Ted when he's uh, afraid of flying and then he actually gets really calm when the plane starts that crashing? Is, is that kind of thing? Yeah. You prepared for something for so long that when it finally happens, you're just kind of like, oh, like that. Like, yeah. Father Ted is like the perfect example of how anxiety, anxiety sufferers are feeling during this pandemic. That's why we're not out in the streets like idiots protesting to get outside. <laughs> uh, but yeah, what a, what a, to get with the games was uh, they, they fill you with a calm because, you know, like, well, it's not this. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it is truly awful. Um, but your day to day life, isn't over do you know what i mean we're not like scavenging or killing each other for food or anything like that like you are in these games or do you know what i mean this yeah. isn't like the, the complete end of the world the, this is just a very horrific terrible thing that and it will pass we will get this vaccine and everything like that and for the most part it can be avoided through just being careful um and stuff like that like um no i, I don't i don't mean to diminish the death toll because death toll is horrendous it is truly horrific and it is you know when you're watching news it's very scary because you're just mm -hmm. like there are so many like innocent people dying like uh, a cousin of mine passed away from it he was in his late 70s and oh i'm very suffering. sorry to hear that no like i like un uh, unfortunately it happened but you know it, like through no fault of his own like even though he was a very old man he had dementia he was still like taking care of himself with this he was washing his hands he wasn't going outside and everything like that he just somehow it got to him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But, you know, and as as horrific as all this is, you know, there isn't like, you know, there aren't like the coronavirus isn't causing you to come back to life and require the flesh for the, the flesh for the living. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's actually what I wanted to get onto because like when, I would say when most people play games, it's in the escapist fiction. They want to leave stress behind in their life and do something more relaxing. Yeah. Animal Crossing is probably like the peak of that. You seem to be oh. doing the opposite. You're engaging in more stressful situations, so I, your real yeah. life is calmer. Yeah. I do have uh, Animal Crossing as well, and that does actually <laughs> help a lot. Um, I I was one of those people that like pre-ordered Doom and Animal Crossing on the same day. <laughs> it kind please of please tell me someone's modded those two games together. Oh, they definitely have. I've seen plenty because uh, it kind of filled the two sides of my personality very well to have those two games, but. Um, yeah, it's just it's it's this kind of thing where it's just like, and I'll, there's also like a significant amount of hope, even in these very awful games. Um, mm. At the end of every Resident Evil, they escape and there's a cure or or something. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. Uh, like Resident Evil is ultimately about hope because you get away from this awful situation. Yeah, the umbrella, the umbrella, uh, uh, umbrella corporation are still inventing like horrific bioweapons and they're going to keep doing it because they're idiots and it doesn't really make a lot of sense when you think about it but yeah but at the end of the day they're still like they're still stopped uh the same with the zombie army games i mean like you're i mean you're killing nazi zombies so that's pretty cathartic um 
dying the dying light game is like it's literally about you uh you're like a cia agent sent in to get the the back to get like notes on a vaccine out and uh but it turns out like the people you're working for are really dodgy and there's like a crime lord that's kind of taken over the city that's been infected and you kind of do away with the two of them mm. and you're left there with like the survivors that are just the good people that are stuck in this shitty situation and you're helping them out and ultimately you get out of it um and i think like yeah i'm escaping to like a world that's like actively worse but there's also this like well each of these things are like are like total world ending scenarios that have like managed to be dealt with as well um so i think it also gives you hope that like oh well if a zombie apocalypse can literally be averted then this can be as well i see so you kind of find a source of hope within the bleakness of these games yeah essentially um that's 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 uh my attempt that's that's what i'm gleaming from it anyway um <laughs> no no you're absolutely funnily oh, enough yeah. uh Oshin wallace who was on last week's episode he's been playing a lot of the board game pandemic recently so i think there is a lot of that going around i think uh, plague inc is also seeing a spike in interest so i think you may be tapping into something that everyone else is engaging with there yeah, there's probably some sort of anxious side guys going on at the moment for like <laughs> uh, mentally crippled uh, artistic people <laughs> just um, speaking as one of them. Uh, like if you're if you're like if your artistic brain is like the the main one, like you're creative and everything like that, like uh, mental uh, anxiety kind of goes hand in hand with it. And I think a lot of people are going down that avenue. Um, I think it. I think it's really good for. I think it can be good for people. Obviously, if I had to recommend something to people, I'd be like, you know, I'll maybe just play Animal Crossing. Um, <laughs> just, just skip the zombie DLC. Like, yeah. you know, don't maybe don't, don't go don't like, go fishing at night. Like, yeah, maybe don't like maybe just stick to the game where like the biggest problem is a trench that kind of, you know, gives you a bit of a gives you a a, a dig and you pass out and that's fine. Uh, <laughs> Well, listen, Keith, we are nearly out of time, but is there Ah. anything, any other games you want to plug or any of your own work you want to plug before we go to our break? Uh, Oh, there's one thing. Uh, A friend of mine, uh, Stephen Jack, I don't know if you know him. You might know him. You run in similar circles. Um, He has a YouTube channel called Hog and Dice. uh, (laughs) And he wrote a very good website if you're into, like, uh, Irish uh, mythology and culture. He goes very in-depth into it. Uh, he wrote. Wait, this a isn't fantastic... the same guy who podcasts on Spotify about Irish myths and legends, is it? He might, because uh, I'm I'm about to plug his podcast. Well, one of his podcasts. <laughs> uh, you know, Stephen to see him. He is a uh, he's a, a tall, long haired, bearded fellow with an eye patch. He is. Uh, <laughs> he, he's uh, yeah. He's he's a character, but uh, a lovely man who is very uh, well versed in uh, history and mythology uh, and theatre. And he wrote a fantastic horror podcast that I had the very good honor of being of voicing the main character in called The Switchboard. Uh, so The Switchboard is on YouTube. Uh, just type in The Switchboard. Hopefully you should find it. Um, it's, a, it's a podcast about uh, where I play a radio show host who is stuck in a lighthouse on an abandoned island because he has a Cthulhu-like creature living in him and discusses uh, paranormal news that comes in. So if you like... Uh, if you wanted, uh, I guess if you wanted Night Vale, but not funny and just heartbreaking, what, uh, listen to The Switchboard. Excellent. So I will definitely check that out after this. I also strongly recommend you go check out Keith's artwork, K. Jables. Uh, yep. It's genuinely wonderful, and there's new stuff up every day. And once again, thank you so much for coming on the show. I've been really hyped to have you on. And thank you no, once um, again for the artwork. No problem. Thank you for having me. No. It was, uh, absolute... no. Excellent. Well, then we will go to our break now. We will be back in just a moment. Are you a nerd? Do you like hearing about a bizarre range of topics from the world of nerd? Does your heart and hairstyle still belong in the nostalgic 90s? Are you a sucker for spooky weirdo things? Well, whether you're a hardcore nerd or a vanilla ice ice baby, Straight Outta Canto is the podcast radio show for you! Straight Outta Canto, that's K-A-N-T-O, Ireland's number one show for nerd culture, nightmares, nostalgia, and more. Straight Outta Canto. 
And welcome back to the Game Corner. Thanks very much to Keith Byrne for being on our first half and, of course, for doing our illustrations. Uh, next, we have a guest I've been trying to have on pretty much since the first episode, actually. It's uh, Martin Karen, uh, an engineer who I've been friends with for a very long time. How are you doing, Martin? I'm doing excellently. Thanks for having me on. Of course. It's an absolute pleasure. So before we get into the games and stuff, because I know you've got some... Uh, really good picks that haven't come up yet. Uh, how have you been managing? I believe you're still working through this whole lockdown thing. Yes, I am working indeed. I'm doing a lot better than I thought I would be, to be honest. Um, managed to get into new routines fairly easily and work is kind of fine. I can do a lot of it from home, lots of conference calls, lots Join of... Join us um, at nerdtonomedia.com Reading things, writing things, um, and... Uh, then getting used to getting active in different ways, starting yoga with Adrian on YouTube, going for Oh, yeah, walks. I do those as well. They're great, crack. Yeah, they're, they're definitely keeping me sane between the yoga <laughs> and walking along the, the river daughter. That's what, what's keeping me sane during lockdown these days. Okay, because, like, um, we've been actually talking a fair bit over the past few weeks and uh like if it's not too personal to say i believe you are kind of in a flat by yourself aren't you like i am indeed yeah so i'm living by myself and yeah it does have its challenges um I, and that's why i thought i wouldn't be doing as well as i am because i'm not really seeing people um but i'm supplementing not seeing people in person with a lot of video calls so myself and yourself have our weekly video call now which is really nice and i have have lots of calls with um i'm in a choir in dublin called uh lake tarry vocal ensemble that we do a choir rehearsal every tuesday um so it's great seeing loads of people's faces there and getting a bit bit of use out of my voice mm. and feels like a bit of normality in uh in weird times and also have calls with some of my friends on Saturday nights as well, where we play games and have drinks and generally have chats. So they've been very helpful when I haven't been able to see people in person. Okay. And like, I appreciate that this is called the Game Corner, but it sounds like uh, games and video games aren't your go-to thing for kind of keeping you occupied when you're not working. Is there anything else that like you've been kind of investing in or over the past few weeks like? Yeah, so I I do have some gaming stuff here, but it's a bit limited. Normally, I would have been a, a big PlayStation player, um, but all I've got in Dublin at the moment is a Nintendo Wii. Um, I've got a DS and the um, the NES Classic as well with the 30 inbuilt games, um, but they're not really my go-to normally. I would have been more on PlayStation stuff. So a lot of what I've been doing is getting into the kind of what I've been calling the quarantine culture stuff. So things on Netflix like Tiger King and Unorthodox and all this stuff that have come out lately. Um, but also, I suppose, just um, keeping in contact with people, lots of messaging, lots of doing Netflix parties, for instance, is a thing I've been doing a lot of um, watching things at the same time and syncing them up. So I've, uh, I watch RuPaul's Drag Race, for instance, every Sunday with my friend Megan. Um, and I pick movies every so often to, to watch with other friends other nights. So that's the kind of stuff that um, uh, I'd normally go to. Okay. And do you, like, this is more of a personal question, but do you find that you're actually reaching out to people more since the lockdown uh, as opposed to, like, when you just did your five days a week and, like, kind of the weekends and all that kind of stuff? Like, or is it about the same? Yeah, it's a funny one. I feel like... I may be reaching out a little bit more, but more importantly, it's kind of the perception and kind of there's no pressure really to go out and do anything. So like I, I'd, uh, you know, we talk quite often, I, I've uh, often got problems with anxiety mm -hmm. and I'm realizing a lot now, even though I'm not really seeing people, which is normally the thing that helps the fact of having everything, uh, the whole context has changed where you can't go out and you no longer have pressure to go here, do this, do that, try and mm. do, you know, the whole city of Dublin is available. You could do anything you want uh, normally. And that's a lot of pressure and can make you feel a bit anxious about what, what to do and how to reach out to people. Whereas now it's 
everything is just stay inside and keep yourself occupied, get a bit active and reach out to people. And now that I've got a routine um, of the, the particular people that I talk to very regularly, it's taken a lot of pressure off and it's actually made my anxiety feel a lot better. Um, so yeah, it's kind of funny where I have reached out to people, but I think it's really the routine that's been uh, of the regular people I talk to that's taken pressure off and that is really helping with that kind of side of things. I'll tell you the most peculiar thing, because uh, in the first half of this show, uh, behind the scenes, I recorded this yesterday, uh, Keith was telling me that he also kind of has kind of wobbles around anxiety and that he's actually been playing a lot of uh, end of the world, a zombie game type things <laughs> to cope with it. Because if he's stressed out in the game, his real life is much more peaceful. Is your kind of routine kind of acting in a similar way that you've uh, cultivated for yourself? Or I feel like it's almost uh, kind of doubling down into uh, the new context and feeling and perceiving things as being happy in there. So it's not quite like that, where that sounds like quite a cathartic thing and actually some things have been quite cathartic like if you put on a really sad movie like when I was watching um what a, a series uh unorthodox about um a woman who left the Hasidic Jew community in Williamsburg New York there's some very um emotional parts of it and you get a good cry on with it and you feel really good afterwards just kind of purging the emotions so that's quite positive but I think for me a lot of it is just about knowing I can't go out I have I can only get in contact with so many people by um, zoom and by all of these different things during a day so let's just enjoy my time on my own let's turn off the phone for a while go for a three-hour walk just feel really nice with being by myself so it's kind of um changing the perspective and feeling positive about being isolated and taking joy in the things that you can only find joy in when you're isolated is kind of what's been helping me. Okay. Well, I mean, you're already ahead of me because I couldn't turn off my phone for two or three hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, on that note, then, I believe you've got two or three games that you wanted to talk with us on the air. So one is actually using Zoom itself. So why don't you take us through that? Sure. So there's a group of friends that I uh, play games with and just generally have chats with and drinks on a Saturday night, um, which has been a really nice part of my routine. Um, so we you know, normally just started off doing bits of chats and stuff. And then after a while, we started saying, you know what, let's start playing a few games, just simple ones on Zoom. So we would do things like Pictionary, which is very easy to do on Zoom because there's a um, share whiteboard function. So you can play those kind of ones quite easy. And can I just and, ask before you go any further, yeah. are you talking about using a solid like whiteboard or are we talking like something kind of on a website yeah. or something like that? No, it's actually a function on Zoom itself. So ah, if, okay. um, I, I'm not, I use Zoom on my phone, so it's down the bottom for me, but it might be up the top on a laptop where it, there's a general share function. And when you click into that, you can share uh, what looks like just a blank thing. And it's kind of like Microsoft Paint in a way. Oh, where it's just okay. A page and you can start drawing things. So it's kind of handy. You can say if I was to give you something to uh, draw for the group to guess, I could just private message you on Zoom uh, and then you'd have to try and draw something and get everyone else to guess it. And then whenever they guess it, you can private message the person who is correct and they can start then the whole cycle going again. So that was what we were playing a lot at the start. But um, then well, one of my friends, Rachel, who's uh, kind of more finger on the pulse of things, uh, uh, games wise um, came up with this idea of doing a murder mystery game right so what she had found was there's this game uh, from the website murder mystery games.co.uk called murder in the red room um, so this is a murder mystery game that's been actually tailor made for online um, and for Zoom and House Party and all of these apps that is tailor made for those uh, for that situation and a lot on their website uh, when you go on to uh, look about it, it 
kind of brings up around it is um, kind of for the current situation of COVID and all that sort of stuff. Um, but they've got other games as well that might, you know, could be possibly tailored to suit. So basically, it's um, a murder mystery game for groups of between 8 and 20 people. And normally between 8 and 14 can play and you can have extra that might just be observers um, that would figure out, try and figure out who was the, uh, the murderer and accuse mm -hmm. them. So um, it's largely kind of a scripted game. So when you purchase it, and actually one thing that's quite interesting about it uh, that they mentioned about the whole COVID situation is, um, so it, it, the website, you buy it from the website and the structure they have for this particular game is that you can pay kind of whatever you can afford. So they um, normally the games go for around 20 euro, but here they allow you to buy it for 5, 10, 15, 20, up to 50 euro, depending on how much you want to contribute or how much you can afford. So that's a, a pretty interesting model for, for doing it in these times. And what you get out of it is a, a lot of um, PDFs, basically. So there would be one uh, person who would leave the game um, and they would get all of the PDFs, which would include all of the scripts for all the characters and also the solution uh, script as well. And uh, kind of a, a thing to keep track of what should be happening um, as the game goes along. So then they would find uh, who in the friend group who, who's going to be on the call would play which character and send them the PDF of their particular character and their scripts. Um, and then it's basically just a, a case of everyone have a look at that beforehand, um, get a bit of time to prepare and come into the game. And it, it's largely following the script. But then one thing that's really cool about it is some of it is very strictly scripted. So the character I played, for instance, was the uh, inspector. So obviously being the person who was interrogating everyone, you'd be talking quite a lot. Um, and not really much room for improvisation because you have to get to certain beats in the game. But then well, all the other characters had certain bits in their scripts, uh, but they could also have some room for improvisation as well. Well, then can I ask you, so um, as a game goes, like, does there need to be someone running the game? Like, or like, um, it would it be more like Cluedo where kind of everyone's in the dark? Sure. So I think there's one person who leads the game and they, I don't think necessarily need to know the answer at the end. They would have access to it because they, they were the one who maybe bought the game, but they don't actually have to look at the end result themselves. They could actually play a character themselves as long as they just find everyone else to be the character. Like when I was the inspector, I didn't know the answer. I was just following kind of a cold read of the script as I went along. So I think as long as someone is keeping an eye on the actions and the beats that need to be hit, um, so that could be the inspector who's the main person uh, talking a lot of the way through the game, or the person who bought the game and uh, maybe had a, a brief look through it. Um, it's good to have someone who's maybe got an idea of what's supposed to come next, but it could actually just naturally flow just from following the script. Um, so it's not really that strict a thing that you'd need to keep an eye on, I think. Okay, and um, I'm sure the next question that people will ask will be, is it a difficult game to learn to play? Definitely not difficult to learn. It's, um, I suppose it depends on people's level of comfort with certain things. So what I really enjoyed about it was um, it gave me a chance to put on a silly accent um, and to kind of have a bit of a, a project for like the day beforehand because it, I had to prepare certain props. Um, oh, so wait, let back up a bit. You knew who you were playing like a day before the party. Yeah, I, I think that's quite important actually. Although they do say on the website they have kind of a quick preparation mode uh, a version and a long preparation version. So they seem to have a version where it needs less props and preparation if you just decided oh, we're going to do this in half an hour, I'll just go buy it now. I think that would be possible. But I really enjoyed having the long preparation version where I went, had to go to the shop and buy a few things to access props. 
I decided to dress up quite nicely in like my top hat and a dicky bow and all this sort of stuff, a tweed jacket and really try and play the part. And I had a brief look through the um, kind of start of the script and practiced doing, you know, a bit of a silly accent, a bit of a received <laughs> pronunciation British accent because I'm the fancy inspector from the Scotland Yard, don't you know? So, um, yeah, it was good from that kind of point of view of having a bit of a project to prepare um, if someone was less comfortable with kind of cold reading a script, then maybe it would be a bit more difficult for them and they would take a bit more time maybe just to look through the script, get a bit more comfortable with it. Um, it's really good when people get to improvise as well. So if people are less comfortable with improvisation, maybe that would be difficult. But one thing that I found was handy was um, if you've got a bit more time to prepare, if you read through maybe the first half of your script, it wouldn't be too much of a spoiler and you could maybe start preparing a few uh, jokes that are outside of the main script uh, that are to do with your character. Um, so th there's different ways depending on how comfortable you are with this. If you find certain things difficult, you could prepare different things to make it less difficult for yourself. Okay. And... Um... Can I just ask, is this the choir that you mentioned earlier that you've been playing it with? Yeah, so there's a group of about eight of us from the choir that uh, have our drinks on Saturdays. So, yeah, we were um, uh, a very kind of vocal bunch, uh, all quite comfortable <laughs> with acting and putting on accents and things like that. So it definitely added to it. Some of them were brilliant improvisers, and I don't know how they came up with half the stuff they did. Like, I'm very scripted. Uh, myself and I did come up with some scripted jokes but some of the improvised jokes were, were brilliant so yeah that was it was good from that point of view. Okay and uh, I gotta ask what props did you prepare? Sure so some of but well, one of them um, was uh, a bunch of betting slips which uh, I was supposed to use to accuse a particular character of something to do with a gambling problem um, and on it, I was like, okay, you know what? I can use this to put in a little outside of script joke. So I started writing names of, um, of what horses could be on these. So one horse name I put on was called falafel or salad, being like the <laughs> vegan equivalent of beef or salmon. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then one called to France because of the whole uh, who's taking the horse to France, uh, Kerry Gold ad, and there's a bit of an in joke in, in our group about that about that ad. Um, so yeah, there was a few uh, things like that, um, things like um, teddy bear with a bandage around his head. Um, it becomes relevant in the story. Um, chocolates, um, pills, loads of different things. Um, depending on what character you are, you, you have different props to, to try and prepare for that. Okay, so as far as like people who might be interested in this, you'd say maybe like a group that's already comfortable with each other, like family groups or work groups, like, uh, is, like who do you think would yeah. enjoy this? I think groups that are comfortable with each other, um, I, but it, it w would be a good way of maybe loosening things up, like if... Uh, uh, maybe a fa family, if you're normally just having chats, this would be kind of a fun way of just uh, bringing in something and um, kind of loosen things up a bit. Um, uh, yeah, I'd say it wouldn't be as easy for people who actually, yeah, people who don't know each other that well, it wouldn't make quite as much sense because mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to improv with people you know and you've got your in jokes that you can kind of think of off the cuff. So if you're kind of small, to medium friend group or family group between say eight to uh, 15 people that's probably the um the best kind of group to, to try and go with okay and uh, just before we move on to your next game where can everyone listening at home find this sure so it's on murder mystery games all one word dot co dot uk lovely now i'm afraid we actually only have a couple of minutes left but you mentioned that there was one particular game you really wanted to talk about uh, before we started recording. Sure. So uh, just when you mentioned about having your uh, podcast about games automatically, I was thinking, what is my favorite game? And it's a very easy one. It's the Metal Gear Solid series. Um, oh. uh, it's just one of the best game series I've ever uh, gotten into. Kind of grew up with it from when I was a 
a young team and then went through all the iterations. It was basically the reason why we well, we got a PlayStation 1, obviously, starting off young, um, played Metal Gear Solid on that console. And then it was the reason why we got a PS2 and a PS3, basically, that, to play the next iteration. That is of high it praise. Time. Now, mm. I must say, Martin, I've never actually played them. This is the game series with Snake, right? Absolutely. So the main character throughout is Solid Snake. Um, and it's basically, uh, it's, a ta- it's a stealthy kind of game where what I like about it is it leaves a lot of options for how you can play it. The earlier games are a bit more just, it's better if you just do it by stealth and it's um, a bit this is more... crawling around in the box and stuff, isn't it? <laughs> the box is a really good meme from it, yeah. So... <laughs> Um, it's got some really standout like pop culture references uh, coming out of it, like uh, sneaking around in a box. Um, and in the earlier games, there was maybe some you know differences of how you could do things. Like you could just be really slow and just wait for guards to turn around and then run, or you could tranquilize them and then run, um, or you could knock on walls and distract them and all this. But as the games progressed into you know, better technology, more uh, scope for bigger worlds and all that. They gave you a lot more choice in how you could go about things to the point where you didn't necessarily need to be that stealthy. You could go in a bit more guns blazing, but it's kind of like pros and cons. Like the pro of being stealthy is, you know, you get through it a bit easier, um, less damage to yourself. Um, You might get certain perks at the end of the game for having done it without any kills. But then the cons that it takes a lot longer because the enemies are getting better and better with artificial intelligence over time, over the iterations of the game. But then the pros of going in all guns blazing, you get to use really cool weapons. Um, uh, It's a bit more uh, satisfying immediately. But then particular games like, for instance, the fourth iteration of the game uh, series on... uh, PlayStation 3, uh, Guns of the Patriots uh, was the subtitle. Um, It had a thing where it had a stress meter. So as you were going in guns blazing, you might get through a bit quicker and a bit easier, but your stress levels will go up. And if your stress levels went too high, it would impact you in the game to the point where you might actually just stop working altogether and you end up like getting sick and um, you can't actually move even though you're trying to move just your character is too stressed out and can't actually move anymore. So it was really clever with some of the um, choices it allowed you to do and kind of some fourth wall breaking in um, the pros and cons of how how you went about the game. Okay, because, I mean, wow, getting an entire console for a game, like (laughs) series, that's a big ask. Like, I think only Zelda I've heard of people doing that for. But one question I want to point out... That's the reason why I've got a Wii, yeah. (laughs) Oh, there you go. But uh, one question I want to ask is, usually when I get to, like, a stealth bit of a game, it's the bit I really hate and just want to get through as quickly as possible. Why is it appealing in the Metal Gear games? I think a lot of what's good in the Metal Gear games is the way the story adds context to things. So it's the story is so rich and has so many different layers that it makes sense that you want to be stealthy to um so a lot of the games for instance have this thing of um maybe a militia group have access to nuclear weapons or this um uh group has um stolen or uh, hijacked the president or stuff like that and it's really about your mission is to go in and make sure that um, the situation is resolved. And as you go in, things start getting messy and you start having to acquire weapons. But at the start of most missions, the idea is you go in, you just uh, free the hostages, you disable the, the weapons or whatever it is, and you get out of there. That's the whole point of the mission. And as the story kind of builds and the layers get more and more the stakes get really high to the point where you don't want to be spotted by anyone and you're absolutely terrified of getting spotted and having to run away and get the alert levels down so that you can continue the game so it really makes you invest the story makes you invested in wanting to stay stealthy i think okay so i didn't realize that metal gear was such a heavy narrative series then 
my God, I don't think you could find a more heavily narrative series. <laughs> um, one joke that we, we used to, uh, myself and my sister that played it a lot, uh, used to have was that it's basically um, a movie with a few bits you can play in between um, to the point where in, in the fourth game, luckily, they added in an option to pause the cutscenes because there were cutscenes that were an hour and a half long, not kidding you. <laughs> Towards the end of the game, there were cutscenes in this game that were an hour and a half. Um, but all the way along, there was all these cutscenes that would be up to like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and you couldn't pause the game. So there were so many times growing up where mom would be like, your dinner is getting cold. And we're like, <laughs> there's still another 10 minutes left of this cutscene. I must confess, uh, I've been playing a lot of Final Fantasy games on the Switch recently, like kind of PlayStation 2 era ones. And it's funny, the shift between playing it on a TV is, as opposed to a handheld thing is you're more acutely aware of how long the scenes are and how little you are mashing buttons. Do you know what I mean? Mm, yeah. I don't know why that is. It's a very shallow thing to notice, but for some reason it yeah. never bothered me when it was on a TV. Like, mm, Yeah, it's funny to think about it like that. Uh, well, we are just in our last two or three minutes, but there was also a game that piqued my curiosity which was you said beyond good and evil i'd seen the trailers for these growing up on the tv but i've never actually played it what what do you find appealing about it sure so this is a game i'm hoping to finish during the rest of lockdown i started it maybe uh three years ago at this stage um and i just never got around to finishing it it's uh, uh, really enjoyable it's um kind of an animate uh, it's an interesting one where it's a different world. It's got a, um, a female protagonist who's very kind of action oriented, is able to do lots of uh, fighting, but also a lot of the story is about, um, it's kind of like she's a journalist and she's finding out information about all the wrongdoings of the government in this different world. And this world is so different to the point of all the other characters around you, pretty much there's a few humans, but most of them are anthropomorphized is that the right way of saying the word? Yeah. Um, animals. Um, so your best friend is a pig um, in uh, the sense of the word that he is a pig, but he's actually a lovely guy. Um, <laughs> and uh, your friends are goats, goat people and all this sort of stuff. And it's, um, it's, again, a kind of a rich story because you're kind of delving into government mismanagement and you're going into all these different sections to try and take pictures to prove certain things. There's a little bit of stealth going on. There's a little bit of action going on. Um, yeah, it's, I, I think I've only gotten a quarter of the way through it, but it's been such an enjoyable story that makes me want to go back and really see it through. Like, I, I want to know what the end of the story is, let alone the actual gameplay, gameplay being very enjoyable as well. And lots of kind of mini games as well, where you're trying to chase people down, a, a kind of like a, a car chase thing. And... Uh, you get extra bonuses by doing all these mini games, but it's one of those where it's got a good narrative, um, uh, linear through story, and there's only a little bit of deviation into the mini games. You don't get too lost in it like you would with the likes of Zelda quests or Skyrim quests. That like you've got a very straight and narrow and little bits where you can delve in and out of it uh, for fun as well. Okay, so if we can kind of find a through line through all these games. You seem to be drawn to games, be they the Zoom games or the video games or whatever, that have a really immersive story you can kind of get your teeth into then. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the and as well, it's nice having a bit of choice in how you can go about things, but I do like the idea of a very linear uh, straight through story uh, but that there's maybe some branches you can come at it from different angles find out new things but that there's kind of a start and an end so I'm not really a sandbox kind of game person in that sense but I do like there is a start there is an end but exactly how you get there there's a few different variations in how you can do it and that you know helps you with replay and helps you enjoy it and like you make the game your own um, so you, you know the story is rich and you're going to get there and it's going to be uh, uh, a good payoff, but you've made it your way of getting there as well. Okay, so like enough kind of options and diversity that you can feel like 
you are kind of controlling the game, but not so much that like you just get lost in the middle of a desert or something like. Yeah, exactly. I'll, and I think as well, having say music that's quite immersive, that really helps as well. So I've got a, an immersive game story and you add in music that really adds to it like the metal gear solid games have such brilliant music in it um uh that it's like i'd listen to it um on soundtracks going for walks and stuff it's brilliant and actually one little easter egg um at the end of the first metal gear solid game there's a game there's a song that's actually sung osquelia in irish oh um i remember when myself and my sister came across it we said why is there a song <laughs> in the Irish language at the end of this thing? Um, it was um, translated by Vlánid Ní Chafik, uh, who was on RTE um, of the years, uh, by a song written by a Japanese composer, uh, but basically translated into Irish. And um, yeah, it's got like brilliant little Easter eggs and, and brilliant music like that. Okay. All right. So we are just out of time, Martin. Is there anything you want to say on the air before we wrap? No, that's great. Uh, thanks very much for having me on, Kian. Oh, of course, and you're welcome on anytime. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Martin Karen, for your recommendation, and to Keith for our first half as well. Join us at nerdtoknowmedia.com.